uh, in Africa uh, through evolutionary time. And she was just an extraordinary figure because of the way she did her work and the way she was very open to new ideas and encouraging of early career researchers. And that was back in the 1980s where these sorts of concepts hadn't really been heard and women in science leadership were quite rare, especially in South Africa. So that's to give you some idea of when we talk about impact, uh, we can think about some very different things in impact, but we really want to focus here on impact in, in the scientific world and then how that translates to the policy world with a bit of a focus on the Antarctic. So as a guide to, to this afternoon's uh, quick presentation, uh, I'll deal with good science uh, very briefly, then understanding the field of the problem, some key pointers on communication, uh, a piece on knowing yourself, your team, your network and your context, and finally thinking about building and managing relationships. So let's start. If, if you want to have impact in science, or in policy from at least the science perspective and not the political or legal uh, perspectives, then what you really need to do is actually have fantastic science as your foundation. There's nothing better at the foundation, uh, at the heart of, of, of influencing science policy, influencing science and influencing policy. And that's uh, why when uh, Heather asked me for a, a quote, I said that quality is better than quantity. And I have a bit of a cycle here, and that cycle really starts with read because you have to understand the context of the work you're doing. You have to have a powerful imagination. So science is certainly not pedestrian as some people think it is. It's, as Peter Medawa said, it's about conjecture, which is of course based on imagination, and then on refutation, which is in fact throwing out your own ideas first before somebody else gets around to doing so. You need really good design, and I've put a double-headed arrow in there because imagination and design uh, have a bit of a feedback loop as one thinks through what design do you need to, to test the question or hypothesis you've imagined or read up about or the hole in the literature that you've seen. You need exceptional replication. Your analyses need to be good, and you need to figure those analyses out actually during the design period Then you need to evaluate what you've seen. And I've put an orange circle around the evaluation because critical self-evaluation and the use of your peers for evaluation, even in amongst your, your peer group, is something that's not frequently done now. There, t there tends to be a bit of an idea that it's, it's quite difficult to, to take criticism from your peers. You might want to send something out to a journal first, but it's very much better to have your friends read your work and tell you that you've made an error and to have somebody else read your work and tell you the same thing, or even worse, to have your paper later retracted because you hadn't spot spotted something that was a fundamental flaw. Once you've gone through that evaluation um, process, the field will have moved on since, since you um, designed your experiments, so there's more reading to be done, there's then writing to be done, and of course, further reading. And I put a big arrow between read and evaluate because in some cases, uh, you may end up thinking about drawing a whole suite of science together for a policy paper or for a review or for some other kind of a uh, meta-analysis. And you may either end up at analyze or evaluate in that process. So I, I want to emphasize that you, you should really not be thinking about impact uh, for science or for policy as an end in itself. You, you really need to think about what you're good at doing what you really enjoy doing, what your, your real interests, capabilities and passion are and work towards those. And then what will happen is your science will be so good that it will be in a position to be impactful itself. And you then need to think very carefully about what it is that, that your science can actually uh, do for the world. Some scientific questions don't lend themselves to that immediately. So I have in my career also worked on how insects breathe. Some insects uh, can hold their breath for a very long time, eight hours at a go. And that doesn't really have um, much in the way of fundamental interest immediately, one might think. One can think of a few um, pest management related issues that might come up, but it's not the kind of science that immediately springs to mind as, as having societal impact. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, society progresses because uh, we find things out, um, we explore knowledge, we come to understand the world. It doesn't immediately have to have an impact. Oftentimes we find that science that initially had no impact at all turns out to be very impactful indeed. Um, a, a good example I like is, is um, I spent a lot of 
my early years going out with ornithological societies, putting rings on birds, uh, mostly just because kind of that's what we did. Um, it was fun, it was interesting, you learned how to identify birds. In some cases, of course, locally, it served a very useful purpose in understanding local movements or what territory size was for science. And worldwide, this, was, this has been done very frequently. And before the advent um, of digital satellite tracking uh, with small devices on birds, in fact, finding out where birds went and how avian flu might get around ended up being based entirely on the ring data from scientists that were doing this and, and volunteers that were doing this because they were interested. So there's no real need to, to have an immediate uh, thought that your research should uh, identify uh, an area that, that really needs to be solved or fixed for the world. Actually doing good science is, is what's, what is the recipe and the basis for all of it. The next thing I'd like to say is you really need to understand your field uh, or the problem that you're interested in. And oftentimes uh, we end up with a lot of uh, busy time, busy work, uh, not enough time for thinking and uh, almost inevitably not enough time for exploring the, the field around us. Of course, there are lots of um, journal articles to be read and so on, but I would draw your attention to the fact that there's a huge amount of information out there. And if you're going to work in an area, you need to spend uh, a fair amount of time keeping up with the reading. And that certainly doesn't mean just reading the latest papers in your discipline specific journals or the areas that you're really interested in uh, or the very broad journals like Science or Nature, although they, they make for entertaining reading because uh, those, those two journal uh, articles um, journals in particular uh, have both a, a perspective section and of course the science article section but you cannot get away from understanding the field you're working in or the problem that you really want to address so the very first way you can do that and you can do it very easily under all circumstances uh, generally these days is simply to keep reading the literature uh, most people who are in the science field are associated with an institute or a university which has a library attached to it and, and often we just forget the libraries that are at our institutions because they perform so well. But without them, we wouldn't actually have any basis for understanding the context of the problem we want to address. The next thing you can do, of course, if you want to understand a field or a problem is to work with someone who understands it better than you do. And th this comes from reading the literature and understanding who's working in a particular area and then reaching out to them and asking them some questions about the work they've done or if they can advise you. Uh, and often at times one thinks that uh, you might be asking a more experienced person in the field for advice on what to do or for advice on a particular area of research. But I can assure you that, that frequently you ask less experienced people uh, for advice because they simply are uh, more expert in an area that you aren't able to be expert in. So this is a classic example where I came to know Cassandra Brooks during her time as a PhD at Stanford University and, and very la uh, much later on I uh, started collaborating with Cassandra simply because she has such tremendous insight into the biology of fish in the Antarctic and of course the way in which the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources or CAMELA works. So reach out to people that um, are actually experts in a field if you need to know about a field and work with them because that's a very good way of understanding and having a new view on, on matters. And of course this is, this is uh, quite self-evident in some respects, but often we forget that the world is filled with superbly smart people and they're very easy to, to connect to at the moment. The second thing I would advise when you're trying to understand the field of the problem is don't imagine that you do uh, to begin with. And the three images uh, you see in front of you, uh, one Karoo National Park, the second me talking to uh, Kim Crosby, who at the time was the the um, executive director of the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators, and the final one, just an image from the Prince Edward Islands Management Plan, is to give you an idea of, of actually talking with people and asking them what problem they had. So I had a colleague who um, set up the Cape Research Center of South Africa National Park some years ago, and uh, the managers of the national parks that uh, were served by the Cape Research Center were completely surprised when this new head of the Cape Research Centre went to the national parks and said to them, so what science would you like us to do to understand your problems? And many had said that previously what had happened, and this is, ends up being true in Australia too, is that scientists came along and said, here's a solution to a problem that you didn't know you had. 
and frequently um, what the those in the delivery side of things, those who are actually implementing policy or trying to see to the conservation in an area, at least in the field that I work in, uh, they have their problems well set out in front of them already. One is able to say to them, look, this, this is a problem you didn't know you had in some cases and present with them, them with a solution. But often they have a multitude of problems that they don't have solutions for and are really looking for solutions. So if, if you're seeking to do work with real impact, it's really worth talking to those people who are on the ground or the policymakers themselves and saying, well, what is it that's a real challenge for you? And that brings me to the second um, image in, in this particular slide. And I, I had a long discussion with Kim Crosby about what is it that the two operators thought were substantial challenges to ensuring that they had uh, environmentally sound private sector travel. And it turns out that they have deep concerns about some things, even though uh, many of us didn't realize that their concerns ran so deep. And they were prepared to spend quite a lot of time exploring the solutions to these questions. And finally, of course, um, governments uh, sometimes make decisions for the very best reasons, like the declaration of the Prince Edward Islands uh, as special nature reserves. And, and then the legislation changes and they are obliged to give effect to a whole suite of new um, documentation or plans for a particular area. And this happened in the case of the Prince Edward Islands. And what one can then do is say, we, we can help you uh, offer that assistance. And one doesn't have to offer that assistance initially at cost. It may be that you are making an in-kind contribution and have to do the work pro bono to start off with because that's just the right thing to do. I'll give you a concrete example of how this might work. Um, if you look at this um, piece of clipped out text here, it's in fact from uh, Annex 5 to the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty that deals with protected areas. And under Article 3, on what shall be Antarctic specially protected areas, there's a statement that areas kept inviolate from human interference um, actually are important in the context of setting a systematic environmental geographical framework. So the question is, uh, and this question was actually asked by a colleague of mine uh, during a discussion I had with him uh, at Monash when he was a postdoc there, Bernard Kutsia, who's now back in South Africa. He said um, in a discussion, well, what do we think wilderness is and what do we think um, inviolate areas are, where might they be? And sometime later, um, Rachel Lee took this question up as uh, a PhD student and uh, has pu just published this paper recently showing, and this is the gray blocks here, where we think people haven't been. So if you look at all the dots here, these aren't actually projections of ice-free areas in Antarctica. All, all of those dots are where humans have been on the continent, and that's about 2.7 million records of human activity in Antarctica. And this is the only way we could figure out to try to give the Antarctic Treaty parties an idea of where the inviolate areas might be, so that if they wish to establish protected areas, to uh, encompass in, in violet areas, areas kept free from human interference, they're now in a position to be able to do so. And as soon as one's done that, one simply has to understand the players in the arena. In an Antarctic context, Sky is very useful because it speaks not only to the Antarctic Treaty Parties, but because it's a, actually a subsidiary of the International Science Council, a special committee of the, the International Science Council, um, it can talk to of the United Nations, IPCC, the Convention on Biological Diversity. So it has this beautiful opportunity to speak to both. And one of the things you have to do at the same time that you're doing your science is just try to get your head around how these things work or speak to people that are able to give you some advice as to where best um, the outcomes of your work are placed. So for example, if you were working on, on ice sheets and the consequences of changing ice sheets and melt and what that'll do for sea level rise, you're probably far better off talking with the IPCC uh, than you are with the Antarctic Treaty Parties, uh, since most of the work that they're doing is focused on the continent itself, rather than on the kinds of actions that have to be taken, for example, through the nationally determined contributions and so on, through the, the um, agreements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, I think under this section, I should just add that uh, many of the things we think are problems now actually have been problems for a very long time. So it, it may be quite difficult in the early years of your career to think that you should follow some of the, the, the background, but I can assure you that it's extremely important to do so. 
So when you have some time off and, and you're thinking of what next you'll spend your time reading if you aren't doing whatever else uh, you pursue, then I can strongly advise you actually try to figure out where some of these problems have come from in the long, in the long run. So for example, if you look at the, at the set of books in front of you, then John Zyman's uh, book on, on the top shelf towards the right hand side, Science and Civil Society, is a hugely uh, useful guide to try to figure out how it is that, that science can actually influence decision making. So their talks like this can help you, but there's just a tremendous amount of literature out there that tells you about how we think about things, why we think about things, and in consequence, how we can actually talk to people about uh, the work that we do in a way that will help them to understand it. And that brings me to clear communication. Uh, what's important in clear communication is that you simply uh, have some understanding of who you're talking to, why you're talking to them, and what outcome you're after. And I certainly recommend to everybody that no matter what meeting you're going into, whether you're going into, say, a meeting in your department in a university, or a coffee meeting with your boss, uh, or a coffee meeting with uh, a researcher, you know, you really need to ask yourself uh, in a professional setting, every time when you walk into that office, or that meeting room, or that lecture theater, or anywhere else, what outcome are you actually after? And as soon as you ask that, yourself that question and get used to doing so on a routine basis, you end up actually um, being much more efficient about the meetings you're in. And it also gives you an opportunity to think carefully about what it is you're going to do and how you're going to respond to the person opposite you. Because that, they will perhaps have thought through exactly the same things. It's also worthwhile investing in advance. So it's very clear when you haven't actually made the investment you need to in a particular meeting. That becomes obvious very quickly. And in effect, you're just wasting somebody's time. So I always suggest that, that you invest in, in the time. And finally, be present in a meeting. So do not be distracted. It, it helps a huge amount to have impact if when you are speaking with someone, you speak with them. Um, if you don't want to speak with them, don't speak with them. Um, but if you have taken the time to meet with them, give them your full attention. And that means your meetings will be more efficient and you will have more impact. They will come to understand that when you meet with them, you're actually serious about it. And that might be one person, or it might be an audience of 50 persons, or it might be a regular routine thing you go to annually, such as an Antarctic Treaty meeting or some other kind of policy meeting, where people know that when you come into the room and you're there to do work, that you actually do the work and you're not there to do something else, like write up on your laptop or um, spend some time on Facebook or whatever it is that you might be doing uh, while nobody else can see what's happening because then you, you're simply not present in the meeting. And in the, if that's the case, you shouldn't bother to show up. Of course, you can also adjust. I, I just have two slides here indicating you can adjust your communication style too, but th this talk is really not about uh, communications and, and how to communicate effectively. There are other people um, that are very good at, at giving those sorts of presentations. But I always try to um, encourage people to think about the audience they're speaking to. In this case, this is a slide from an, a talk I gave to the Antarctic Treaty Parties. And I really wanted to tell them how unusual Antarctic microbes are because they can essentially suck hydrogen and carbon monoxide out of the air and use that to produce energy. And the only way I could think of doing this without giving them a, a huge biochemical lesson, which nobody would have liked anyway and fallen asleep during, was just to point out that this is, this is a third way of, of, of making life work. So the first one's chemosynthesis, and we know about that. Photosynthesis, uh, even more people know about because that's where most of our food comes from. And then finally, there was trace gas scavenging. So try to think through the things that will really resonate with the audience that you're talking with. And in that context, the next slide is a slide I showed uh, somebody that lives a couple of doors down from me because I, I think that impact begins uh, in your neighborhood. And the, the person was unconvinced that climate change was a, a real problem for various reasons. And I showed them this, this image. These are two images that come from the island of South Georgia, 20 years apart, um, almost to the day in December. I visited in 94, and this is a picture of the Neumayer Glacier and the Neumayer Glacier in 2014. And because the person is an engineer, they could understand how much heat energy it took to, to melt all of that ice because of the high heat specific, uh, high, uh, heat, high heat capacity of water specific heat capacity. So you can see that these peaks, um, of the same peaks and in, in effect the whole of the Neumayer Glacier has left this area and the beautiful Gulbranson Lake is gone. The next item um, I want to talk about in, in, in the how to have impact is simply to manage uh, 
essentially four things. So the most important thing to manage to begin with is yourself. You really have to be able to manage yourself in context to understand what makes you upset, what really gets you, how somebody can work you up very easily. Because if you want to have impact in a policy context or in a science context, you have to make sure that whatever irritates you is put to one side and that you can remain calm and engaged because often disagreements arise from misunderstandings, not because somebody necessarily wants to disagree with you. And then if they really do want to disagree with you, uh, it's best that you actually keep your cool during the whole process so that you can focus on the reasoning, the argument, and what your alternative strategies might be. So of course, I'm not always possible to do so. Humans are emotional beings. So one just has to practice a bit at trying to understand what really picks up uh, the emotional content of the meeting and, and try to avoid that. Understanding the context is really important. So where you're talking, who you're speaking to, what are they likely to do? We have lots of opportunities these days to do a lot of background work without actually talking to many people, but it's also worth talking to them. So of course you can stalk people on the internet in a sense by looking up their CV and looking up the previous places where that they work, what their opinions have been, what um, social media posts they've put out. You can understand a huge amount about them then, but you can also ask their colleagues what it's like to work with them. And, and this is actually also true in a job interview. I'd do all of that to find out if I was working at a new place what people thought. Um, you have to manage your network. And if you're an early career researcher, you might think you don't have a network, but you do. You have the network of people that sit around you. You have the network of, of peers uh, um, and of people in, in your university. You have senior university folk. Uh, when I move institutions, I usually go to everything that I'm invited to, every cocktail party, every function simply so I can meet people in a context that's, that's a little less artificial. So instead of arranging a one-on-one -on -one meeting and feeling super awkward, if you, you go to a function where they're making some awards, then you bump into people and you say, oh, I'm so-and-so, how are you? And it's much easier. You will also, also have a team, uh, irrespective of, of what um, career stage you're at, you will have a team. That team might be you and your dog. Uh, for me, when I was an early career researcher, it was myself and two border colleagues. That was essentially the home team, there was nothing else. But slowly you build up a team, you may work with a good colleague, you may work with collaborators, and you really need to manage them too. You need to understand what their requirements are and so on. Because if you have going to have impact, you really need to understand this whole context and work well within it. And you do have to understand also that you may have to be slightly different people in slightly different contexts. That's not disingenuous, it's simply responding to the environment that you're in and understanding that they may want to hear something different from you. So you may be uh, a very high level scientist in one area, and you may be actually just somebody who's a really cool person that does research uh, in, in the deep seas or on uh, high mountains or, and so on. And finally, the most self-evident one, I think, but one which people often neglect is build and man maintain your relationships. So you really need to work at this uh, if you want to have impact. It simply doesn't, help trying to write something from far away and then expect that magically, if you fling your research paper over the fence, that somebody will pick it up and think it's the best thing that they've ever read. Of course, the researchers in your area will do so, as a matter of course, but your paper will uh, probably go no further. Um, many policy makers and decision makers will not read any paper that you write. Uh, a, they often can't get access, and B, and if, even if they could, it's far too long-winded for them. Uh, it's much better sometimes just to talk with them and to maintain those relationships. So if they need to know something, they might end up texting you and say, I saw this thing on the news that was about some new methane seep off the Antarctic. Uh, should we be worried about it? Is a big, big issue. Do you know anything about this? And of course, then you, you've immediately established that relationship and that access to policy. But then you should continue them. And my view, my personal view anyway, is not to let any... Um, professional relationship that I've started um, wane to any great extent. So I spend quite a lot of time just emailing people these days, texting them, writing to them. If I'm coming to a place, visiting them. Uh, I visited South Africa last year and I made sure to catch up with as many people as I could. Uh, there was a meeting that um, related to SCAR and to the South African National Committee for SCAR. Uh, in the central image in the middle here, I saw Mike Wingfield, who's an amazing connector and collaborator, and it was a great pleasure to meet up with him again. And the reason for doing so is not only are you able to then to have impact, but people can have impact on you. You learn tremendously large amounts from them. I, I stay in touch with, with almost everybody I've worked with and make sure that 
that I keep up a regular communication with them. And that takes an enormous amount of investment. So if you want to have uh, impact, you have to really think about the fact that there's a lot of uh, management and work that you have to do behind the scenes. It doesn't come uh, very easily or very straightforwardly. And with that, I just want to end with uh, a statement. Uh, many people ask me where the, the name Monash University came from. Uh, it comes from Sir John Monash, who's uh, a really famous statesman and a person in Australian history. And he has a statement that is in fact uh, upfront in, in most of Monash's values. And I think that that speaks very well to impact in science and policy. And that is, if you're after impact um, for yourself, well, you know, you may end up getting impact for yourself, but it won't have impact more generally. Uh, impact comes from actually wanting to do something that's for the benefit of the community. And sometimes you'll end up disagreeing with people what that benefit is. But if your aim, both of your aims is to actually benefit the community, then inevitably one finds a, a way through whatever problem it is you're dealing with. And with that, just a thank you to uh, the people that have supported me over the last little while, the Australian Research Council, the Australian Antarctic Program, Monash, of course, uh, my research group and students. And then we have just uh, started a, a new uh, special research initiative funded by the Australian Research Council. It co it'll commence early next year. And that's provided um, a very good impetus for the kinds of, of thinking that has been done for this talk. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Stephen. Uh, very insightful. We have quite a few questions here, if I'll jump straight into it. Um, the first one is, if, if I'm interested in science policy, are there any uh, jobs in policy for scientists or what sort of experience should I need, should I need or uh, where, where can I follow, where can I find experience in policy? Well, that will depend very much on, on the, the setting uh, that you're in. But um, for example, I would say here in Australia, as an example, if you've done some good work, you can actually, it's very easy for us to say that here we have the Australian Antarctic Division, we can talk to them about your interest in policy. They may not have a job for you, but they may actually be able to tell you what it is they're interested in doing and, and how you might be able to contribute. Uh, when I worked um, at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, uh, I frequently had the good fortune to interact with those who were responsible for uh, the South African delegation to the Antarctic Treaty. And the best way to start off is to say to them, actually, we can help um, if you would like us to think about um, what the items are that are coming on, up on the agenda, how the science is relevant to it. And we frequently had uh, very good interactions where they said, oh, you know, there's this question coming up. South Africa is quite good in that research area. Is there a way that we can contribute? So to start off with, um, looking for jobs in the area um, is quite straightforward. You can just look for policy positions, but often one doesn't get them because they're after somebody with more legal training and so on. So the way, the way I suggest you go about it is, is depending on your career stage. But if you've trained as a scientist, actually go and talk to people in the area and volunteer your time to begin with. And I think that that's always a very good way to start. And in fact, that's how I got involved anyway, is I volunteered my time to Sky, And as a consequence of working with Sky, I ended up going to the treaty meetings. And none of that was paid work at any point. Um, all of the work that I've done with Sky has been uh, volunteer work and that in-kind support has come from the institution that I work with. And often they, they really weren't that interested in a sense either. They were very happy with it all, but they were not contributing any cash. And I ended up doing most of that in I would have called my after hours time. Okay, thank you. So, um, do you think that uh, at an early career research level that there is opportunities for us to contribute to policy form formation or um, is it more for once you become established and you have experience in the field? Uh, Lisa, I think that there's a huge opportunity if you're doing good science and you're looking at policy decisions that are made and you think that actually they're not based on the science. So, for example, uh, you could, because, because they're freely available online, in an Antarctic setting anywhere, you can very easily go and get the, the um, outcomes of the meetings of the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Parties that I hold on an annual basis, usually. Uh, and the Committee for Environmental Protection, if you're in the environmental area, and actually look through what they've decided. And if you think, hang on a moment, you know, this seems pretty weird. Why aren't they acting, for example, um, on emperor penguins? And you've just done research on emperor penguins. 
you, you can actually then get involved and contact the, because all of the information is online and say to them, we've got this amazing amount of information and you can either do it individually or you can do it organisationally. So Apex, for example, could push it through to Sky and say, this is striking us as pretty weird. There's all this information, why isn't it going to the treaty or why isn't it going to the Committee for Environmental Protection or why isn't it going to the IPCC? And it's very effective if you do so with a few people and that's something Sky always does is look around to who's working on the area, what allies, what colleagues do we have working in the area? And you can simply do so. There's nothing that stops you. And if you would like to, I would encourage you to do so. I think very much um, there's, there's often a much greater and easier insight because as an early career researcher, you're not constrained by the history of the organization and what people will think of the decisions. You're just looking at the data and going, why aren't they doing something about this? And I would encourage you to do so. I, I do tend to tell um, early career researchers really to focus on, on getting a very good science track record. But that should not stop you from uh, contributing to the policy environment and to policy discussions. Because uh, if you're smart enough to be doing science, you're smart enough to be doing and uh, making contributions to policy. Thank you, Stephen. You're just to um, add on to your answer um, for anyone that's interested in getting involved in policy. Apex uh, is regularly involved in committee meetings uh, where they use early career researchers in meetings to just observe or sometimes to contribute. And they just recently had a call for ECRs to join in on the um, climate change uh, assessment report to be contributors or editors or in, in some form or shape take part in that. So if you're interested, yeah, keep an eye out. As he said, everything's online, um, but Apex helps you to just streamline through all of that information um, as a connection point. Um, thank you, Stephen. Then there's another question on, uh, you mentioned the treaty. So since the treaty has an expiration date, uh, how would, what would happen when it expires? Would it be extended? Do you think there'd be a, a review of the conditions of the treaty? Um, what is the situation? Well, the treaty itself, that's the 1959 Antarctic Treaty, does not have an expiry date at all. So it's a signed treaty and will continue to um, run until such time as um, somebody suggests it should be um, ceased, and that's unlikely to happen uh, in my view. So there's, there's no mandated expiration date for the Antarctic Treaty itself. Where um, some of the confusion comes in is that the um, Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty uh, was agreed in 1998, it came into force in 1998, it was agreed in 1991, I think. It came into force in 1998, and what the protocol actually says is that if after 50 years, someone wants to actually raise a question about the operation of the protocol, they may do so. So that's in 2048. So somebody can actually raise a question about, uh, any one of the parties can raise a, a question uh, about the operation of the protocol in 2048. But if you then look at the sub clauses for any change, they, they're actually quite stringent. Um, that doesn't mean that something couldn't happen, of course, but they require all of the um, consultative parties at the time to agree. They require a majority of other parties to agree. So there's a whole, there's a whole set of, of fairly stringent requirements uh, to be um, overcome to make a change to the protocol. And my view is that, that this is uh, really unlikely to happen. In terms of resource, um, because I, I can see uh, some of the question there, the terms of uh, resource harvesting, that's actually dealt with under the, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMELA. And that's also unlikely to, to go away, but negotiations can become more difficult in these in these fora, in the treaty itself, or in the Committee for Environmental Protection, which is advisory to the treaty, or indeed in Camelot. And they can end up being stalemates where nothing gets done. Uh, and for years, no decisions are actually made, and then the environment actually uh, deteriorates as a consequence. So I would say that, that I'm not so much concerned about the treaty having an expiration date, as I am concerned about the extent to which we have de deterioration into the future in discussions. And I say that because we can see that the democratic um, approach generally in the world is showing quite a lot of deterioration. So there's lots of laws and so on, but mostly uh, what really helps a democracy to operate is actually the conventions that are associated. They're not necessarily written into law, 
but it's just the way we understand we should behave. We understand that you, know, you can have your own opinion, but you can't really have your own facts, but people think now that you can have your own facts. Um, I see they never um, try that on with gravity, but generally they, they try it on with very other, many other kinds of facts. And as the democratic debate actually deteriorates globally, so it becomes much harder for these organizations and treaties to operate. So I think that one of the things that's essential in this respect and is essential also for early career researchers is actually to engage also with those outside um, the science field especially and to think about those in the humanities fields who are thinking really hard about how do we get the democratic conversation back online? Has this happened before? Um, how do we actually pursue an agenda where we can get people talking sensibly with each other? And I think that crossover between disciplines will become more and more essential to ensure that we, we bring the debate to its previous democratic um, status where we didn't have this incredible polarization frequently of the discussion where we rather recognize as people we will always have differences of opinion and that uh, what democracy does is enable us to, to work through those differences and reach the end game which is, is often very similar for us even though we're coming at it from different angles. And even if that end game is very different then to try to find where the compromise is uh, at least over the shorter term. Thank you very much, Stephen. I think um, you've made it very clear that science, linking science and policy, you work coming from different um, scientific disciplines, but you're also working with people with different cultures, different agendas, different, um, you know, like you said, democracy. So um, it really is a complex issue, but the, the sooner we get involved and, and increase our impact uh, or our, our philosophy in life, the, the greater impact we'll have. Thank you very much for sharing um, with us and for your time. Uh, it's amazing that we can have you with us all the way from uh, Australia. And we've got a few people thanking you um, in the chat. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we also appreciate everything you've done for, for South Africa and that you can, can uh, represent South Africa in SCAR. And we hope to have you back soon. And um, all the best with your research. And yeah, thank you, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to everybody for listening. Um, I, I really enjoy interacting with all, you, all of you. And yes, as, as soon as there's an opportunity to uh, return to South Africa and have a discussion, I'm sure I'll make the best of it. So thanks and have a very good meeting. Thank you very much. If you still have questions for Professor Stephen, you can um, just add it to our Google Doc and we will try to find some answers for you. Um, the Google Doc is a is a working document just posted in the chat box and you can um, add any questions to any pa panelists that you would like to ask so thank you very much <laughs>